Hello everyone, I'm Carla Sanders, Cosmic Crone, and I am with you today to talk about the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction. I have been meditating on this conjunction deeply for the past, oh, six weeks or so, and I want to share with you what is coming to me as the metaphor that you can carry with you throughout 2021. And if anybody is listening who has had a Divine Feminine Astrology with reading with me in the past couple of months, and we've talked about your own natal Jupiter-Saturn conjunction, how the, where this is landing in your chart, um, pay close attention to what I'm sharing with you because it will, uh, it will add to the reading that we did. Uh, it will give you something new to understand whatever's happening. Um, I'm gonna go over the chart just for a minute. It's not an intense uh, astrology reading. It is more a teaching on the mystery. And uh, just to give you some background, if you're if you have not been looking in the western sky and watching these two planets, bright Jupiter and a little bit dimmer Saturn just above, if you've not been watching them grow closer and closer together, then the next time that there is a clear sky uh, just after sunset in the very early evening, go find a southwest view and look keep an eye on them. Now, to my dismay, where I live here in Maine, the coast of Maine, we've had clouds. I have seen Jupiter and Saturn. I saw them once earlier this week, and every night it's cloudy. Even if the clouds disappear at sunset when they are visible, there are clouds in the west. So I'm watching. I think there are two predicted sunny days for me to watch them over the next two weeks. So what's going on? Saturn and Jupiter, they are the two largest planets in the solar system other than the sun itself, which behaves as a planet from the perspective of Earth. And Jupiter, they are in the late degrees of uh, Capricorn. They are already in conjunction the energy that I'm describing today is already active and working on your life. What is so, what gives this the magic is that on December 20, well, okay, let me, let me give you a little bit. They are both going to enter Aquarius. They are leaving Capricorn for good and entering their sojourns, their separate sojourns in Aquarius in conjunction. They are already within um, arc minutes of being exactly conjunct when they enter Aquarius. Now Saturn enters Aquarius on December 17th, that is next Thursday, a week from yesterday, and Jupiter enters Aquarius on December 19th, which is a week from today. And they are already in conjunction and then they uh what happens next well they're they're just hanging out together moving slowly through the first degree of you know the the zero degree zero to one of aquarius they are moving together very slowly and then at when um, 5.03 in the morning, Eastern time of December 21st, the sun enters Capricorn. Now when the sun enters Capricorn, that is the solstice. In the Northern Hemisphere, it's the winter solstice. And the Southern Hemisphere, it's summer. And I'm going to be speaking of the energy of the winter solstice because that's that's where I live, it's where my ancestors dwelt, and we're going to be tapping into the metaphor of light. 
So, about five hours, five hours, yep, at 10.19 a.m. on the morning of December 21st, Jupiter and Saturn make their absolute exact conjunction at zero degrees, 28 minutes of Aquarius. I did all of this figuring last night. I was kind of obsessed about it. And they are going to stay together like that for almost 24 hours. And then they're going to slowly start separating. But this is a conjunction, an exact conjunction that is lasting about a week where they're going to be within one, one and a half degrees of each other. So it's already happening now. All right, what does that mean? When the two biggest planets are in a conjunction, merging their energies, and at the same time, the sun is entering Capricorn, which in the north, it is the shortest amount of daylight, the longest night. Well, what? let's explain solstice. Solstice is when the sun stands still. Um, our ancestors marked the sun, the life-giving sun, uh, older than old. They were probably marking the sun during Paleolithic times, certainly well before writing. Um, and because they recognized that the rhythm of the sun was the rhythm of life. It was the rhythm of the animals that, and the plants that we used for food and the cold times and the hot times and the dry times. And so they really needed to know. Um, they, they had an intimate relationship with the movement of the sun and the moon and the visible planets of which Saturn and Jupiter are two of the most visible. And they would notice that the sun, in its rising and setting along the southern horizon, here in the north, it would reach a point of stopping. And at its southernmost stopping point, when the days are short and the nights are long, they celebrated, they honored, they honored the death of the light. And so we have already, since Samhain, since Equinox really, been in the crone of the year and the dying moment of the year. The light has been dying, dying, dying. And we use that, our spirits use that time to die. To die to old habits, disappointments, failures, to die to, um, we could say, to die to that which no longer serves us, or I like to say, that which is completed in our lives. We honor completion. We honor metabolism. We honor another year of life. And the sun stands still at that point for about three days. Uh, and of course the sun is never still, but it just, as it kind of locks into place, it's southernmost rising and setting on the horizon. And then it begins to expand backwards towards the summer solstice, which is its northernmost point on the horizon. And for our ancestors in the northern, especially the far northern places, the Scandinavians and the Celts, Northern European, and our um, relatives of Turtle Island in the north, and probably even in the far east of China and Russia, the, what is now the Russian steppes, all of these places in the north honored that moment of dying and rebirth, the rebirth of the light. Slowly, the light returns. And there's still a lot of winter left. That light is a promise. Uh, and it is a promise that some of the people in the solstice ritual may not see the fruits of, because there is still the long, hungry time 
until Beltane and first harvest, equinox, when things warm up and the grasses come and the new lambs are born. Um, so this is, this is what our DNA remembers. And it's what my DNA remembers. And I am slowly, as, as I become a crone, learning to honor it. And I've always honored it, really, because the story that I grew up with, the Christian story, mimics this solstice. Um, and I will bring that in a little bit more later. So what is happening in this moment? Why is this so significant? These big planets are here bringing their energy at the moment that the sun opens the gate of transformation of rebirth and what are the energies well Jupiter is expansion and abundance life gifting Jupiter is a great gift and an expander and I always tell people when we're talking about Jupiter to pay attention to your mind and your words and what you're thinking about and what you're creating because Jupiter will expand what you give it, what you give him. Uh, so if you're creating something, if you're creating health and life and abundance and food and love and pleasure, then keep your focus on those things because Jupiter will expand whatever comes into his path. Saturn feels like the opposite. Saturn is limitation. Saturn is boundaries, gateways, walls, laws, rules. And we often feel like Saturn is pressing upon us, telling us what we can and cannot do, granting and withholding permission. Um, and he is, he is, he, he is saying, you came here for a purpose, get busy. Um, and the two of them working together, they are creative force. They are, they are the life force burgeoning and expanding and full of joy and abundance and eros, Jupiter and his uh, Greek counterpart Zeus were randy sexual gods. They fucked anything they could get their hands on. Saturn was not like that. He was much more in charge of time and um, work and effort and um, ethics and getting it done. And he's also, uh, we associate him with the sign of Capricorn. He rules Capricorn. And Jupiter is an ancient ruler of Aquarius. No, no, I have that wrong. I think Saturn also ruled Aquarius in ancient times before Uranus was discovered. Um, so when the two of them get together, what happens? Well, this is where I have a helper. I have a prop. This is my cauldron. This is a beautiful pot, a, a stoneware pot made by my friend Jody Johnstone, who studied in Japan and mastered the art of throwing pottery. And she has this extraordinary wood-burning kiln that's the size of this room. Um, oh, just across the ridge over in Swanville, uh, near me. And so I, I love this pot. I like to fill it up with vegetables or rabbit or chicken or venison and put it in the oven and let it cook for a few hours. But what I'm going to tell you about now, I'm going to use this pot to explain the effects of Jupiter and Saturn and how you can work with the energy. So here it is. You see... There is a lot of space in this pot. It will hold a solid two quarts of food. And it has this beautiful round shape. Well, it started out as a ball of clay, about this big. 
and I don't know if you've ever thrown pots, if you've ever seen a video of someone throwing pots, um, or if you've ever done that in school. But what happens is there is a wheel that goes round and round and round, and in order to make a shape like this, you take this lump of clay, a ball of clay, and you plant it in the center of that wheel, and then you have to center it. And you center it by pressing. So I'm going to stand up. And so imagine that there is the wheel going fast, 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 and you are pressing. And you're kind of taking one hand to shape the base and one hand to press down. And so you can feel that crushing, that centering the wheel, the turning of the wheel to, brings the clay into the center. The pressure guides it. And, and then you douse it with water to keep it lubricated. So you've got all these elements going on. And so imagine that you are a clay and you're being crushed and smushed into the center. And then the potter takes the thumb and begins to make a hole in this centered lump of clay. And then just imagine, just imagine this. It started out as a lump of clay and the hand goes in and it makes an ever enlarging space. And on the outside, what happens is the two get pulled up. They get pulled up like this. The inside hand is expanding and the outside hand is containing. And so you can direct through your body motion and the pressure, the shape of this pot. Well, the inside hand that is expanding that ball of clay is Jupiter. How big can we make this? Let's make it as big as this lump of clay will go. And Saturn is saying not too big, because if it's too big, you will not have a shape. This only works if there is containment. And it can be an open shape that's a bowl, or it could be a closed shape that is like an amphora that stores oil or wine, or, or a vase for flowers. It could have handles and spouts. It can be so many things. But it has to have that expansive uh, expansion outward and that outer pressure inward in order to create a shape. So Jupiter is on the inside expanding, Saturn is on the outside containing. And if you are a lump of clay, you might be thinking, what the hell is going on here? Life is, life feels like a lot of pressure. And then what happens if the potter gets it wrong? If the potter stumbles, if the pressure's off, if there's a flaw in the clay, if the wheel slows down, a wobble gets introduced. You're coming up, 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 and phew, a piece of you gets splattered against the wall, or the whole thing breaks. And what does the potter do if the shape, you know, gets out of whack or breaks or falls apart? starts the centering process again. Squish, bring it up, squish down, bring it up, get the air out, squeeze that air out. So I think you get the idea. It is very intense to be a lump of clay on the wheel under the potter's hand. And all the last several weeks as Jupiter has been making conjunctions to Pluto and then it's getting closer and closer to Saturn, we have been feeling it. And we've been feeling it with the coming of the cold here in the north. And we've been feeling it with COVID spikes and we feel it every year. Um, this is just a very special time to notice that we are being shaped by this event. And 
And, and so what I invite you to do is just to allow it. Don't fight it. Be with the shape. Recognize, accept that soon enough, first you have to be shaped and then at some point you will go into the fire and you will emerge as this extraordinarily beautiful pot. But there's another metaphor. When I start imagining this whole idea of expansion and containment, I think of the cauldron. This is a cauldron for me. Um, I cook in it and I I just adore it. It's a cauldron of beauty and it's a cauldron of function and it's a cauldron of nourishment and it's a cauldron of alchemy. The things go in raw and they come out amazing. And it's the black hole, the supernova. It's the cosmic womb. So think of Jupiter and Saturn. The womb is a container, this size. And it is constantly kind of in this expansive and contracting because with the moon cycle, the, the, the womb expands and contracts with the cycle of the moon, sheds blood, uh, cleanses and prepares builds up the blood again and prepares to potentially receive new life. And then when that life comes in, think about the ovary. The ovary, the follicle of the egg swells, expands, and releases. Again, that's Jupiter energy. And it travels down the fallopian tube, and if it meets that spark of ma masculine energy, the sperm, then there is a supernova of energy released. And yet in order for that to become a human being, a new baby, it must be planted in the womb and time and expansion and containment must happen. So imagine that we are now in this time, we are in the cosmic womb. Solstice is the cosmic womb. But Saturn and Jupiter are cooking us all. They are incubating us. We have that expansive energy being contained and held and compressed and alchemized by Saturn. As an artist, as a ceremonialist, as a, a person who has worked with clay, I know that there is no art, no food, no life without those two forces of containment. Form is contained life force, contained expansion. Mm. I'm thinking of some of my Lilith metaphors and wondering how they all add up. It is a mystery, really, how we expand and then we contain. But somehow we would be, if we were pure expansion without this grounded rootedness to the earth and to our bodies, then we would be angels. We would be non-physical entities. But we are here in a body, and so we are subject to universal law and the law of the body and the laws of life and the laws of society and community. And this, this is just where we are. And so we can ask ourselves the question, who am I in this time and place? Who am I in this law? What has this time of squeezing and compressing and building and expanding. What is it creating of me, this lump of clay that I am? So here at Solstice, we have 
Jupiter and Saturn. And we have all that that represents. It is not easy to be here now. It is not meant to be easy. And surrendering and allowing and letting go. We always like to let go at the new year, whether we're thinking in terms of solstice or we waiting to the calendar turn at December 31st and January 1st. What am I letting go of in the new year? Well, you're letting go of what you finished with, of what is truly complete. And if you wanted to make a list of those things, you could. Or you could just say, it is done. And I don't even have to know what it is. And focus instead on this moment, this still point, this centered point, where you can feel your emptiness expanding at the very same time that the container is holding you. Because what is that holding? That is the hand of the divine saying, you are loved, you are safe, you are making it, you're going to make it. And then the light comes again. So the treasured story of my childhood, Christmas story it's called, the, the light of the world, Christ, he starts the story in a womb. Mary is riding on a donkey's back, being taken to Bethlehem in the company of her husband. And while she's there, it's time for the light of the world to be born. And so it is time for him to emerge from the darkness and the containment of the womb and to be born, to be born in the body of an infant. And he will grow as an infant and experience God experiencing life as a human being. This is the story. And this is the beginning here at Solstice. That story, whenever it actually happened, if it actually happened, we don't know. But the story has come to have been merged with the ancient Solstice story that is much older. And yet many divinities have been born with the same metaphor of being contained in the womb, being mystery and potential, being darkness, and then emerging, emerging by definition through the feminine. Life can only come from the cosmos through the feminine. The work of the masculine is in that moment of ignition. And then in that moment of surrounding and protection. But the feminine is what births light. What births life. And so the feminine contains all of this Saturn in the womb, which ultimately squeezes and forms and that journey through the birth canal, which is an ultimate experience of Saturn squeezing as if teaching you, this is what it means to be human and in a body, you get squeezed. But then you draw breath and you expand again. This is what we are living right now. And this is the meaning. I didn't do a reading. I don't need to. I don't need to. Your work is to meditate on this, to know who you are, to be still and quiet. And on the, during this time, at some point, honor with ritual. 
my friends and I are preparing a ritual to do here um, in person, um, socially distanced and out of doors, where we will, we will embody this story that I've been telling you, this, this story of being contained, of being in the darkness and then being reborn with the light. And I think what the one thing that Jupiter and Saturn brings to this moment, it, I think the last time it happened was sometime in the Middle Ages, and I don't even remember the date, didn't look it up. But what we're noticing is that it happens, I mean, it's been a really, really, really long time. And so we pay close attention to this moment, and we recognize that this moment is a moment that changes us. We will not be reborn the same. We do not step into this moment of conjunction, of solstice, of honoring darkness and being reborn into the light. We step in one way and we step through and out on the other side another way. And so trusting that that is happening and you do not have to understand it or know what's going on with your mind. But just allow it and say, it, it has happened and it is done. And this is where the letting go comes because safety would say, I must cling. I must bring all of that with me through this portal. And if you do, it will be toxic because it, unless there is a consciousness to transmute of everyone who is coming through with you, you will be bringing, you will be bringing illness. I call it illness, dis-ease. You will be bringing something that will not fit. It's a challenge for us human beings. This is what you must be prepared to let go of. And if anybody is not coming through this opening with you, and how will you know? They ridicule you, they refuse, they turn their back on you. They um, tell you you're wrong, they'll, they'll tell you you're a sinner, they'll ignore you, or they'll just leave. Do not cling to them. Do not take it upon yourself. One way that we cling is we say, oh, I did something wrong. This is all my fault. We take on what really has nothing to do with us. So if you are listening to my words, you are called to step through this portal with consciousness and surrender and releasing some of the need to control things with your mind but allowing your body, your energy, your heart, your womb, your balls, whatever part of you, male or female, is walking through, to walk through this and sense that even with the containment of Saturn, you are going to be an altered and transformed container of divinity on the other side. So whatever else you hear about Jupiter-Saturn conjunction from other astrologers, and I recommend you listen to what they have to say because everybody has something important to contribute to this. There's, there are lots of meanings. Um, remember this. The, this is the essence. Jupiter expands, Saturn contracts. They're making a new pot out of you. And if it feels like a big squeeze, that's because it is. But on the other side is new life and rebirth. As always, you can reach out to me for your own Divine Feminine Astrology reading to see how this is affecting your life personally, uniquely. Just send me a message and I will let you know your next step. 
So you're, you're here now, you are in it, you are in the squeeze, and in 10 days, be sure you find some time to look at these beautiful things. So many of these potent moments we can't see, but we can actually watch the sun as our ancestors did, and we can watch Jupiter and Saturn get closer and closer together in the early evening sky. And as you do, you might just give up some of your emotion around this process and offer it up to them. They'll help you. Thank you so much for joining me. I will see you next time.